Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's special edition of Xbox One on One. Of course, I am your host, Mr. Boomstick XL, and I have an exciting program here for you today. I have been once again bestowed an incredible opportunity, and that is one to sit down with the lead developer, creative director, and founder of Sketchbook Games, Mark Backler. Mark, welcome and thank you so much for sitting down with us today to talk about your new game that released on April 6th called Lost Words. No problem. Thanks very much for having me. It's great to, to be here. Well, you know what, Mark, uh, you know, you and I, uh, you know, let's give some people a little behind the scenes baseball have been in touch with one another for over a year. Uh, I got a chance to, um, you know, through different avenues, take us uh, take a peek at to what you were working on, uh, which, of course, at the time was lost words. And uh, obviously getting you to sit down, we talked about almost over a year ago. And here you are today to talk about this game. You know, one of the questions questions that I think many people that are going to tune in and, you know, and, and check out this show is they want to know who Sketchbook Games are, how many developers are on your team, and how long were you working on Lost Words? Right. Um, so, yeah, it's been um, quite a long uh, development. So it first started as a, uh, a game jam game, um, and that was about eight years ago. And then I was working on it sort of on and off in my spare time for a couple of years. Uh, and then it's been probably like the last six years that I've been working on it full time. And uh, yeah, first released on Stadia about a year ago. And um, uh, yeah, now... Uh, just in the last uh, two weeks released on all the other platforms. And I think it's, it's actually been about two years since we were first in contact. Uh, yes. The, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, and thanks very much for your uh, support. Uh, it was, yeah, really nice that uh, you, uh, you you featured us before, and it was, yeah, great to uh, to, to chat to you then. And uh, yeah, so Sketchbook, um, it's about seven of us in the, the team at the moment, but there's been quite a lot of people that have worked on the project uh, over the, the years, really. And um, uh, yeah, so, you know, we've got quite long, uh, long credits for the, the game, and lots of people helped out in sort of various different uh, capacities as, uh, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so some sort of local to uh, to me in um, Ipswich here and others sort of spread uh, around the UK and uh, a couple even in uh, in other countries as well. So we've sort of been working remotely for, uh, for, for quite a while now. You know, I'm glad that you bring that up because obviously in 2020, uh, the world was hit with a pandemic, and many uh, of the developers throughout the world had to learn how to pivot and work remotely. Now, this is something that seemed to affect bigger developers, and I know that this wasn't actually one of the questions that we were going to talk about, but because you mentioned that your team is pretty much uh, spread out all over the place, were there any challenges uh, working on this game during 2020, or is that something that you had become accustomed to? Um, so I guess in terms of the development, we were already quite used to um, working remotely. Um, so we, we do have an office space at uh, Essex University at their innovation center there. So me and um, one of the programmers from the team, Dan Collier, uh, would meet up and, and work there. So that was one thing that uh, that, that changed with the pandemic. But uh, yeah, like I mentioned, the, the rest of the team were sort of working uh, remotely already. So um, yeah, it wasn't really too much of uh, a, a change for us. So we were quite lucky in, in terms of that, that it didn't really affect us. Um, we were due to have a, um, a, a kind of a, a press day at uh, GDC last year. Uh, so that got canceled because of the right. pandemic, unfortunately. And, and there's, you know, I, taken the game to lots of shows uh, during the development and I was quite looking forward to, you know, people would often say, oh, is it out or when's it available? And so I was looking forward to being able to be at shows and, uh, and you know, demo it to people and say, oh, it's available now. Um, so, yeah, we've unfortunately sort of missed uh, all the, uh, the physical uh, 
shows really but you know ho hopefully things are starting to to get back to normal now and, and we we might be able to attend some uh, some different events i'm definitely looking forward to uh to being able to, to catch up with other developers and to uh to to meet players and and show the game off so that yeah is the the area when it's probably affected things most of like showcases and uh, yeah. Yeah, the game in front of players and and press yeah, you know what? One of the uh, events that uh, I mean, well, all of the events in the world have come to a, a you know close. Like even E3 of 2020 was canceled. And I was going to that. That would have been my second E3. But smaller shows like PAX is a great developer slash community show because we get to go into these indie um, showcases and talk with you guys. And that's one of the things that I think was solely missed, especially on the smaller development a community uh, and hopefully you know you're going to be able to see we're all going to be able to see that turnaround with you know the vaccines finally being available and hopefully at some point maybe in 2022 we'll see some sort of normalcy getting back to the live shows because i actually been to quite a few of the packs pack east uh, more specifically and loved it i, I just love the environment i love the atmosphere and i love talking to devs like yourself and many others that just you know that, that have seven 10, 15 people on the team that are just not considered these big development houses. It's great to get in there and rub elbows with you. Um, but you know what? I, I, I want to I talk about the uh, lost words uh, beyond the page, the world design. You know, in addition to both the side-scrolling adventure, which you see on the screen right now, there's a storybook platform aspect that is extremely unique. And I don't think I've actually seen it done before this way. What were some of your inspirations for Lost Words, uh, you know, in, in regards to its design? Did, did, did any other older games, like side-scrolling games, you know, point you in a direction that the team wanted to go in. Yeah, so we tried to kind of take inspiration from lots of different sources, really. And uh, so there was uh, sort of games like uh, Ori and the, the Blind Forest. I knew you were going to say that. I knew it. Uh, Night in the Woods. And so lots of these games kind of, because we were, you know, the, the game was in development for a long while. The, these were games that were sort of releasing alongside. But um, yeah, Life is Strange as well, people. Um, uh, you know, came and told me, oh, you're, you know, the fact that your game is in a diary, it kind of reminds me of the UI from Life is Strange. So then I went and checked out Life is Strange and, uh, and loved it. And even though it's a different type of game, uh, yeah, you know, they, they do the, the like journal and watercolor and sketches and stuff really well. Um, also Child of Light. Uh, I guess I was a bit worried when they first announced Child of Light because it, you know, I hadn't been working on this for all that long then. And, and they were doing a lot of the same things of like two, two worlds, like real world and the fantasy world and a young girl and kind of dealing with um, real world issues. And so, yeah, I was a bit worried. It's like, oh, is everyone just going to think we're, uh, we're copying them? And, um, uh, but yeah, you know, people people like that game, and it, it's a very different game. You know, they had the like turn based combat, and um, and we're sort of more focused on the the narrative it, itself. And I think yeah, they're sort of different um, different audiences. But yeah, so tried tried to draw inspiration from kind of a, a, a variety of different games, as well as films, uh, things like um, the Labyrinth and Never Ending Story for those sort of really interesting fantasy worlds uh, i yeah. can't hear you actually I yeah no i was just saying that my th those are two of my wife's all-time favorites films cool. yeah yeah they're real uh, real classics and uh, one that came out um uh partway during development as well was um uh, a monster calls that's that's really good that's yes. like fantasy world and uh, tackles the the topic of loss as well and um yeah, it's just such a brilliantly done film. And so I read the book for that as well uh, after seeing the film. And um, yeah, so we sort of tried to draw inspiration from some different books as well uh, as like uh, pieces of art and uh, adverts and kind of, you know, from all sorts of different places when, when you're kind of in that creative creative uh, process you just you see all these different things and you think oh that's really cool and i could use this for that and yeah you just sort of um everything can be uh, a potential source of inspiration really
You know, I, I will say this, you know, I, I love that you went, you told us some, some behind the scene, uh, creative, you know, ideologies on how the game came to be. But I want to say that be, even though you, uh, you compare yourself to like Life is Strange, which is an indie darling and Ori and the Will of the Wisps and, and, uh, you know, these are all classic, like classic w with a huge following. Your game never felt once like it was copying the other it really yeah. does feel like its own entity again especially with the story now we were talking behind the scenes and we're going to get into the story momentarily uh but i do want to i want to ask you you know listen for me I, I'm, I'm about maybe three and a half hours into the game and i wanted to have it finished before i obviously sat down for the interview and i believe that i am close but i personally felt an extreme amount of emotion with the subject material. And I told you this privately, and I'll say it you know, for everyone to hear. I had an incredible relationship with my abuela, which of course is Spanish for grandmother. Uh, I spent a significant time as a young as a young kid with her because not because there was problems at home. I loved my parents. My parents were awesome. They were super young, so they were like hanging out with friends. It was awesome. But I loved my grandparents. And this story being told through the main character seems very personal, specifically with, of course, the grandmother. Can you elaborate on the decision to tell this story? So uh, I always really wanted Lost Words to be something that could help people deal with uh, a real world issue and so it could have like a, a positive impact. Uh, to begin with, I um, had the story being about uh, divorce because it's so much more common and I kind of wanted to tackle that from a, a child's perspective nice. and, uh, and, and do something that could um, uh, kind of be helpful for any, uh, any, any kids who were, uh, who's parents were, were going through that. Uh, when Rihanna uh, Pratchett came on board as the, the writer for the project, uh, she uh, she said that um, she thought uh, loss was kind of more more powerful uh, a topic and yeah. also more universal. Uh, so we uh, we changed it and, and went with with that in, instead. And I think it was something that, um, you know, she did draw a lot on her own relationship with uh, her grandparents. And uh, so yeah, it is sort of um, very uh, personal and um, uh, yeah, lots, you know, there's different stories of like the um, grand dropping the yogurts at the supermarket. That was actually, uh, you know, that was one of Rihanna's grandparents and she uh, she put that in. I think there's a few different bits that are sort of uh, taken from her real life experiences as well. Wow. Yeah, we're going to get into to, to, to her in a second because I I mean, she has a resume that's pretty impressive. And I, and the combination of having her be involved with you is that needs to be, uh, uh, you know, spoken about. But uh, I do want to um, just say a, a big, a big thank you to CYV Studios, uh, who basically drops a $5 super chat and um, John Mitchell drops a $10 super chat. And uh, actually, the first question I want to ask you from the community, and I, again, I think you might be able to answer this. And this is from CYV Studios. He wants to know if you could recommend a sim cinematographer who uh, um, who would want to get into development and has some background with C4D and Maya. Right. So like what would be a good uh, a good route into the games industry? I suppose that yes, I, I believe that's what he's asking. Um, like, how, how does one become an indie developer, or even showcase their talent to a potential developer looking for talent? So I guess the good thing about game development these days is it's so much more accessible than it's ever been. You know, you can download Unity or Unreal or uh, Game Maker or any number of other uh, game engines for free and just get started. And um, so that's that's kind of one. Uh, one one good way of, of showcasing your your talent and also like honing your skills because I think by actually doing it you know it teaches you so much and uh, game jams can be really good for that as well because it kind of forces you in a short space of time to get stuff done otherwise it can be tempting to just sort of you know be doing loads of tutorials forever and things but when you've got this short deadline it really um, yeah it's very helpful that it gives you this kind of box to to work within and it's often quite 
amazing what you can come up with in such a short space of time when you when you need to and it really sort of laser focuses you because you're like okay i want to do you know x y and z well how do i do that and then you look up a tutorial and find the, the thing that uh you know teaches you that and then Great. you try it out and okay didn't work try something else and uh, then yeah it's just a very um uh, motivating really and then you know you've got something really cool to to show at the end of it hopefully and that can be a really good way of sort of building up your your portfolio and your your experience and I think that's what people often look for at companies they want you to have made something and actually started um, you know doing it off of your own back Oh, that's uh, that, listen. I could not have asked for a better answer. Wow! Uh, and uh, John Mitchell drops a very generous ten dollars super chat, and he says, "Game looks amazing." Wow! You can't teach talent. So, Mark, you're getting some fans uh, <laughs> with with the game today, which is awesome. But I, I want to move on to the next question, if that is okay. Yeah, uh, okay. One of the interesting aspects of this game is at least for me that stood out, is the character creation uh, system. Now, it's simple in its setup, though important enough that it, that it feels like it actually matters. Now, uh, what I'm talking about, and if you haven't played the game, I want you to see if you can elaborate on this, is you, know, you go from choosing the name of your character to the color of the clothes that she's wearing. And of course, one of the important aspects, the pendant stone. It all really felt like it mattered to me. Like I sat there and I went through the names and I went through the colors and I try to make everything just seemingly go together. Uh, was it designed that way? Uh, so we we kind of really wanted your choices uh, to to matter and um, uh, yeah the the look of the character seemed like a really good um, good way to to do that. I think the pendant was one of the last um, ones that that we kind of put in because it um, it kind of started off that you were you were choosing an object and you would like carry that with you and it was going to be i think either like elder ava's um special teapot uh <laughs> pendant might have been one of them or it was something else as well but it was kind of um uh you know a whole bunch of issues with the animations on it and it didn't really flow so so we kind of ended up changing that to being different colors of the the pendant okay. and uh, so so that worked really well but yeah the the name and the um uh, look of the the character were in there from from quite early on, and it's definitely yeah something that it, it's nice to sort of give give people a, a choice on that, and then that you know it affects like half the the game since uh, since that point, and something I want to kind of keep thinking more about for future games as well, because you know players love choices, and, yes. and you want to kind of um, yeah make them matter as much as possible but it is such a difficult thing because if you have anything that's kind of too too branching then you end up making like double the amount of content and um, uh, and you know that only a certain percentage of people are going to see it and if you get a choice that is less popular you might be spending you know a lot of effort making these assets and things when only wow. a small number of players are going to see it and something even the big AAA companies deal with like when I was at Lionhead and worked on Fable Two, um, yeah, we had had a similar thing of you know you want you want the choices to matter as much as possible and there's ones when you know you're like draining a swamp and like completely changing a level and um, so that's a big thing. But if you if you have other big choices and they all kind of mount up, then then it definitely gets really really tricky and, and you get that problem of like things are branching too much. So it's kind of a fine balance and you want some choices that make a big difference, but then other ones that kind of maybe like branch a little bit, but then come back to a main path. And uh, yeah, you've got to kind of balance it all. I think Mass Effect is a series that does that amazingly. And I don't know how they do it, to be honest, because, you know, you've got choices that you make in game <laughs> one that you come to in game three that are still making a difference. It just seems nuts, like how, how they possibly manage that. And I've, I've gone back and I've made different choices on submissions and you think, okay, well, it probably just branches really quickly and then comes back. But actually, like, yeah, it, it can make quite significant differences. And uh, yeah, it's really um, like awesome the way they, they've managed to do that. Okay, so you know what? If, if it's okay with you, uh, I, I'd like to move on to uh, question number five. And, uh, you know, you had Rihanna Pratchett 
who uh, who was attached to this project, and she is no stranger to uh, award-winning work. Now, she worked on Heavenly Sword in 2007. She worked on the other game, Overlord, in 2007. Then again, on Mira's Edge in 2008. And this is where I start to get very excited because she worked on Tomb Raider 2013 and then the follow-up, Rise of the Tomb Raider in 2015. How did this collaboration actually happen? Uh, so there was kind of a couple of uh, routes and I'd uh, been offered some funding from a, uh, a publisher and they had um, uh, emailed Rihanna and then uh, at the same time uh, I took part in the um, uh, like Space Ape uh, Great British Winter Game Jam with some of my colleagues from uh, Marmalade and uh rihanna was one of the judges there and our team oh, wow. had to get picked as the uh the the winners which was really cool and uh, yeah rihanna had played our game so much that one of the other judges uh didn't get a chance to uh to have a go <laughs> which seemed like a good uh, a good sign that she was that engrossed and wanted to uh to to, to complete the game and um yes yeah, so I, I kept in touch with her after that and then we all met up and um uh, had had lunch and uh, showed her lost words and even though it was really uh an early stage like it didn't have any of the astoria stuff in it then uh, the like fantasy world um that sort of all came later but uh yeah she you know she she saw potential even in the um sort of really early prototype so this was like um about 2014 i think so she's she's kind of one of the uh, well, I think she is the longest serving uh, team member other than uh, myself now. So. <laughs> I mean, that is pretty incredible. Uh, now, obviously, you have a great working relationship with her. I would imagine that if you ever wanted to collaborate again, she'd be the first person you'd give a call to because her work speaks for itself. I mean, one of my favorite games of last gen was Rise of the Tomb Raider. I thought the story was absolutely fantastic. And to know that she's a part of that and now a part of this, wow, that's got to be super special for you and the team. Definitely, yeah. It's been uh, been really cool. And, uh, yeah, she's done such a, a brilliant job with the, the game. Nice. Uh, we, uh, we we won an award for the uh, narrative for the game as well. We got the uh, Excellence in uh, Narrative Award from uh, DevGam, which was really cool. You know what? I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the awards because speaking of awards, uh, Lost Words has uh, received a number of awards dating back to its original showing and has been credited with over a dozen accolades, including Best Indie Game, Best Casual Game, and Most Original Game at the Game Connection Paris. Uh, it also received the Special Selection Indie Award at Reboot Develop. Um, and uh, Yuki's UK game of the show at Gamescom. I mean, these are incredible accolades for the team. Seeing the reception that Lost Words has received must have been an amazing feeling. C can you share your thoughts on the amount of awards that your team has uh, has received from this title? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been really cool, and like yeah, it made uh, such a difference. And uh, also, some of the um, uh, prizes from different things have been stuff that was actually really helpful uh, early on in development. Like I didn't have uh, loads of money for different hardware, and um, wow. one of the prizes in. Uh, the Intel Buzz competition that we won was a free uh, like uh, mini PC, and I used that for like development for that's half awesome. The project. And um, uh, these headphones are actually uh, we won from um, the um, uh, from like a local uh, games festival, the Rapture Game Show, and uh, so yeah, it's been. Uh, uh, been really helpful in, in lots of different ways and, uh, you know, helping to open some doors and raise awareness about the, the game as well. And uh, just kind of very motivating for the, the team to know that, um, yeah, people really like, all, all, you know, the, the result of all their hard work. I mean, it's 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 I'm going to be honest with you, just sitting back and, and hearing these kinds of stories. See, this is what I love about doing these interviews. Sure, it's great to do the podcast that I do weekly and talk about the you know greatest and breaking news and what's what console is getting what. But 
it's the in the trenches stuff like this, knowing that the headphones you're wearing, you won from a contest. The PC that helped build the game was won from a contest. I mean, that I super appreciate you sharing that. That is pretty epic. Um, but if it's okay with you, I'd like to move on to the next question. Um, you know, looking back at the awards is, of course, awesome. Uh, though something happened on social media that I'm not sure if you're aware of. Uh, someone that you may or may not know, head of Xbox, Phil Spencer, not only played Lost Words, but publicly talked about the game on Twitter. And here is his exact quote. I'm playing this game, and it's a really special game. Fantastic atmosphere, writing, and mechanics. If you haven't given it a try, I recommend it. Now, considering the position that he carries within the industry, how does this make you and the team feel that head of Xbox, Phil Spencer, is commenting on your game publicly? Yeah, it was so awesome. Like, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of people saw that tweet and, and got in contact with me about it. And um, yeah, really cool. Just so, yeah, so wonderful that, you know, he, he played it and, and liked it so much. And he'd recommended it to, to lots of people. As well. yes. I, 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 I messaged him afterwards and he said he'd uh, been uh, buying it and gifting it to, to people. Oh, and, that's uh, awesome. Even his two uh, uh, daughters in their twenties, he uh, yeah. he sent them copies as well. So uh, yeah, it's really really amazing that he uh, he he loves it so much. I, I got to tell you, you know, we talked about this privately. You know, with Phil Spencer, he, I got to be honest. Like, I I don't know a lot of people within the industry. You know, I've only been doing YouTube for three and a half years, and I'm kind of getting my feelers out there. And I've been able to interview people like yourself and Joe from Song of Iron. It, it's been an incredible process. But the one thing that I love about Phil Spencer is how he carries himself and how he's at his core an, a gamer just like us. And for him to step out and talk about your game, man, that is got to be the best feeling in the world. I mean, knowing, I mean, again, you already have the accolades. You already have over a dozen awards, and that's great. But to hear the head of Xbox talk about your game, man, that is, that's got to be one of the coolest moments. At least it would be for me. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been uh, been amazing, and um, <laughs> that uh, yeah, I, I used to work at, at Lionhead, and so uh, oh wow, Phil, Phil Spencer would come and visit the studio and and speak to the whole team, and he was always uh, sort of really motivating the the talks he he gave, and uh, yeah, I had such respect and admiration for for him as a leader because I think he's just you know he he managed to be so down to earth, and yeah. um, you know he would he would speak openly with the whole team and um, have people ask him like really direct questions, and he always um you know answered them so honestly and and openly and uh yeah he's just like such a such a brilliant leader you know i think he he does a really incredible job yeah i that's pretty good i mean again these are the interviews i was just talking about how i didn't know you work for lionhead that's awesome i mean <laughs> i mean who would have known but you know what i i, I want to continue because we're having such a great time i want to continue the questions you know the game was published by modus game on xbox playstation nintendo switch and steam uh, was the constant the conscious decision to make lost words beyond the page a multi-platform release from 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 the beginning of it so uh i think you know it, it's uh it's a lot of hard work to to make a video game and if you're going to put in all that effort it seems to me to make sense to sort of put it on as many platforms as you you can Absolutely. So, um you know we we were aiming for Steam uh, in the, the very early days. And then um, uh, when, you know, I, I was hoping we would be able to, to, to put it on consoles. And when, when we signed with Modus, then, you know, we knew we would definitely have the uh, capability to, to do that, which was, was great. And um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think it always makes sense if, if you, if you can to uh, to to like hit as many platforms, but it, it can be tricky though because it, it can be diminishing returns on some yeah. of the like smaller platforms, and it can take 
um, you know, varying amounts of time to to port the game to to different platforms. So I guess you, you know you do have to weigh things up and 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 be careful. But certainly for all the the big consoles, you know, they, there's uh, such a lot of uh, players with with them, and um, yeah, just really nice to. To, to get your game on on those platforms if you can can manage to to do that and felt really special playing lost words on switch as well like having it ha handheld is uh, awesome. sort of quite a moment yeah you know what i mean listen i, I i'm with you I, I agree i think the more people that can experience this very special game uh the better and i like i said i am uh i've you know I, i'm someone that is uh like Towards the end of it, I cannot wait to to uh, to beat it. And you know what? Because I love my Switch so much, I find myself buying games twice. So I will definitely look to support your you know support your your company and buy it on Switch. Because like you, I like playing on the go sometimes, and this is a perfect game. Lost Words is perfect for on the go. Uh, I mean, thank you for sharing that. Again, this, uh, I I love the, the the honesty that that's coming out in this uh, interview, and I I can't thank you enough for being here. Uh, you know what? Let's let me get into the next question. You know, in game development, more times than not, teams are looking to release a game and hopefully enjoy the title success, which I have no doubt ske Sketchbook Games will receive. Has your team decided on what you're going to make next? So we've got a uh, an idea of the, the the next game. We've sort of started doing a bit of prototyping on it. Nice. But we also want to do... Um, some kind of uh, market research and, and okay. see if there's definitely an audience for it because um, it's kind of uh, slightly uh, unusual mix of things. So um, okay. yeah, it's definitely good to um, you know to to do some tests and see uh, what platforms it might work for and um, yeah and, and if there's kind of a intersection of people who like these uh, these different things and um, uh, yeah I, I think it has good uh, good potential but it, I think it definitely makes sense to, to try and you know spend some time to, to take a look at that and, and see that there's uh, definitely a, a, a sizable audience there. Oh, I, listen, I can tell you this. You are going to gain a significant amount of fans and followers looking towards your company's next game. I mean, obviously, when I got up to this particular level, I immediately invoked uh, you know, the feelings of when I played Limbo. And for me to feel that in a game like this, as good as it is, that's saying something special is here. And like I said, I, I'm so glad that you gave this small channel an opportunity to talk to you today because I want to get everyone to know about this game because I think that, again, personally, it meant something because of my connection with my grandmother. But I think that this would have a real connection with many many others and again he, to, he, to have to hear that phil spencer sent it to his daughters who he talks about all the time who are diehard gamers like him man i, I just I, I i can't i cannot get over that that that's so good that's so cool um but you know what Let, let's get on to the next question if that's okay you know that's every great. Every content creator needs a break from time to time. Now, for me, like I produce four live shows weekly, and uh, but I still find a way to make time to play games. At least I attempt to. This week has been kind of tough. Uh, I've been enjoying Lost Words, obviously, Octopath Traveler, Outriders. The big question that I kind of want to ask you, and and it's very 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 rarely asked in the development community, is. What have you had a chance to sit down and play? So uh, I, it's, it's actually been a few weeks since I, I played a video game. We've been so busy with Lost Words, and I thought <laughs> things might might be uh, less busy after launch. But actually, there's still uh, so much to do, and sort of trying to to share the the game with people and, and promote it. So um, uh, yeah, lately uh, not much. But um, I'm part way through Cyberpunk at the moment, and so oh, I definitely nice. need to, to get back to that and uh, and finish that off and. Um, uh, yeah, I've been trying to sort of um, focus on one game at a time. Although Hades came out as I was playing, so that good, dude! Oh my goodness! So many people had been uh, like uh, bigging up Hades, and uh, so then I, um, 
yeah, I, I picked it up and then uh, got really into that. So uh, I played a whole load of, of that as well. Uh, so I definitely want to, to get back to that and uh, and finish it. I got really close to the end, but I didn't quite uh, quite complete it. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I mean, listen, you know, you know what's great? I'm, I'm, it's amazing that you mentioned Hades because this is a game from an indie developer that turned a lot of heads that OPS, by the way, was in the running for game of the year last year. I mean, it's it's an incredible thought that just because it doesn't have three A's attached to it, doesn't that, that it doesn't mean that it's not you know worthy of your time or even the nomination. And again, playing your game, I think people are going to walk away tremendously impressed. And I, I I don't know. I don't I don't have an award ceremony for my you know double barrel gaming, but I can I can see people having this in their top tens because it's of how special it is. And I listen. I, 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 you know, I've blown enough smoke for you, and I hope that it really does let the, you let the team know how special I think this game is. I think you're going to start hearing more and more people in the community talk about it. But before I let you go, I do have one final question, and this is another one that not many uh, YouTubers or content creators will ever ask. You know, the indie scene has exploded in the last couple of years through the quality of smaller titles, and they are certainly on the rise. Uh, now, we've seen the importance of strong indie titles in the industry with 2020's Hades by Supergiant Games that got nominated for many Game of the Year awards. Now, 2021 is no different with games like The Ascent and Scorn and 12 Minutes and Tunic. You have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, you know, uh, Shredder's Revenge, Kenya, Bridge of Spirits, another PlayStation exclusive, Season Looks Amazing, Sable, Axiom Verge 2, and finally, one, of the one, one, one game that everyone's looking forward to, Hollow Knight Silk Song, and that's just to name a few. My question for you, Mark, is what particular indie game has really come across your radar that you cannot wait to play in 2021 uh so i'm not sure if it's a 2021 release but i've been looking forward to somerville for quite a long while like the the okay. gifts of that and the the animations like looks really incredible like um kind of a, a throwback to um uh, another world and uh yes. flashback stuff like that so um yeah i think that will be really cool and um uh, I also uh, played one of the um, games at, by uh, one of the, the teams at the Stugan Games Accelerator, uh, which is called Un Unpacking by uh, Witchbeam. And uh, that's kind of a game when it's all about you're unpacking the boxes of uh, someone who <laughs> you don't ever actually see, but oh. you kind of learn you learn about them from the things that you're unpacking. And, wow. Um, <clears throat> and where you have to put them so it's kind of uh, i think they describe it like a, a zen puzzle game uh so yeah that seems very cool it's so so different to anything else i've uh, I've, I've played before really and um yeah another one of the the stugan teams is uh making a game called letters that's uh kind of um uh along the same lines as uh, lost words really but it was sort of developed uh very uh independently but that is it's also set um kind of uh in the pages of a book but also on wow. postcards and on a kind of uh msn messenger equivalent so you're sort of learning lots about the um the main character from the the letters that she's writing to her her pen pal and uh, oh, wow. you're not kind of you're not walking on the words themselves but you do walk on like the the lines on the paper and you can pick up the words with your character and move them around and use them to kind of solve all sorts of different puzzles and stuff so if people like uh, lost words then uh, letters might be worth uh, looking into as well nice well those are great picks and obviously the one thing that we can all agree on is that because the indie community is so large we're getting more and more uh, special titles. And every, every, every title that you mentioned, I want to play. I hope that, you know, the titles I mentioned are something that you want to play. Like, for instance, Kenya. Wow. That's a PlayStation 5 exclusive by a very small team that looks incredible. The Ascent by Neon Giant 
that potentially could be a game of the year for some people. It looks incredible. Uh, but I got to tell you, Mark, I mean, again, this has been an amazing interview. I, I cannot thank you enough for hanging out. And I am definitely going to get the word out for Lost Words. But I'd like you to do me a favor, a favor before we end the, uh, the interview. Can you tell everyone where they can find this game? And more importantly, where could people send you know your team messages of encouragement from you know when they finally play it? Sure. Thanks very much. Uh, so uh, we are at Lost Words Game on Twitter, and that's probably a really good way of uh, contacting us. Um, the studio Twitter is uh, Games Sketchbook as well. Um, but yeah, the Lost Words uh, Game one is probably the easiest place to uh, to, to find us. Uh, we're also on Facebook under Lost Words Game as well. Um, and the website is uh, sketchbook.games. And so there's uh, sort of different contact information uh, available on, on there. Okay. And what other, wh where is it available, the, the game? So uh, it's on Steam, Stadia, uh, PS4, Xbox, um, Switch, Humble, GOG, and Epic. So, wow. uh, so sort of quite a, a spread of uh, platforms. <laughs> so people well, can dig their pick. Yes, absolutely. And you know something, once again, I, I wish you a tremendous amount of success. I cannot wait to hear what your next game is going to be. Once again, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us today. And, uh, you know, maybe we can get you back at, at another time just to be on a podcast and kind of just talk games. That'd be great. Yeah. That well, thank Excellent. you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. Definitely appreciate it. And of course, I want to thank everybody who tuned in to the newest addition to Double Barrel Gaming. Of course, that is Xbox One on One. And I am your host, Mr. Boomstick XL. Mark, thank you for being here. And Thanks we will me. see you the next interview, which will be coming very soon.